Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. As they said, I'm Robin Graham. We can drop the doctor. I have a question for all of you, a couple of questions to start with. How many of you have experienced anxiety? How many of you have experienced anxiety to the point that it has held you back from doing something you really wanted to do? Anxiety is an abnormal apprehension or fear to do something or interact with someone, most often accompanied by physical signs and symptoms. It prevents you from doing the things that you love. It holds you back in fear. Nervousness is similar to anxiety. However, once the situation that you are nervous about has ended, like after I finish this talk today, <laughs> I will feel good about it. After you go through that situation or that interaction or that experience, those nerves kind of fall away and you feel good. With anxiety, that doesn't happen. With anxiety, you continue to have what if thoughts, negative thoughts. Did I mess up? What were they thinking about me? Did I look funny? Did they not like me? Will I be welcomed back again? All of these negative what if thoughts. Worry, on the other hand, is a dwelling on negative thoughts that you can actually control. You can choose not to worry. We can't choose not to be anxious. Anxiety oftentimes has a genetic component, and that genetic component will hold us back even further or cause our anxiety to be worse. With worry, we typically, typically don't have those physical signs and symptoms. And again, with worry, we have a choice. We can choose not to do it. With anxiety, we oftentimes need therapy or medication to help us navigate it and push us through, and it often takes a team effort. Now that you know those definitions of the three terms, how many of you experience anxiety? Still a lot of you. How many of you get nervous about things that you cannot control? A lot of us. And how many of you worry about things that you cannot control? Still a lot of us. 31% of adults in the U.S. have anxiety. Women are twice as likely as men to have anxiety. Only 37% of those people, that's 37 million people approximately, seek treatment for their anxiety and their symptoms of anxiety. Interestingly enough, over the past two years, the prevalence of anxiety has increased by 25%, most prominently in women and youth. So if I can put in a plug for my book, that is the reason I share my journey and I want to help other people navigate anxiety so they don't have to struggle through it for all of the years that I did. Some of the signs and symptoms of anxiety, because it does manifest physically, our brain is so connected to our body and vice versa that symptoms of anxiety are going to manifest physically. Some of those signs and symptoms may be that you might have experienced or could experience in the future are unexplained stomach aches, headaches, fatigue, inability to sleep, irritability, outburst of anger, change in eating habits, eating more than usual because you are anxious or eating less than usual because you can't stomach food because of the anxiety. In order to manage anxiety, you have to be able to recognize the triggers of anxiety. This is where mind-body connection is so critically important. When you think of any symptoms that you may be experiencing, any of those that were on that list, and you think about what could be triggering these physical signs and symptoms. Maybe it is an interaction with another person. Maybe it's you have a trip coming up. You're planning to travel. Maybe it's you have out-of-town guests coming to stay in your home. Maybe you've fallen on financial hardships or you've had unexpected bills that are piling up. Or it could simply be that your child is navigating something very difficult and you're trying to help them, but you're overwhelmed. Any of these triggers can stimulate those signs and symptoms of anxiety, but how we navigate those is what is most critical. Let me give you an example. 
Today is a perfect example, actually. If you think about having to go to a networking event, maybe you put this event on your schedule a couple of months ago, and all of a sudden, as time is leading up to this event that's going to occur, that you have been planning to go to, you are experiencing these signs and symptoms of anxiety. And you're experiencing this, but you haven't quite put your fingers on it, but you look at your calendar and you realize, aha, I have that event coming up. I think that is what's triggering me to not feel so great. Maybe that's why my stomach is upset. Well, how can you navigate that? The first point that you want to do is discover what about that event that is coming up is causing you to feel the way you're feeling. Is it you don't know what clothes to wear? As women, that's something that I think we all stress about from time to time. <laughs> Today, too, right? Exercise, dress, what do you wear? Um, but you have that, that thought. What, what can I wear? I don't have the right clothes. I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to look good enough. Or maybe it's that you don't have anyone to go with and you're afraid because you don't know anyone. You know, having a wingman provides a lot of confidence. <laughs> or maybe, like me, you're an anxious introvert and small talk is exhausting and challenging. So what can you do to navigate that situation? You can create a strategy. You can start with Googling, right? I mean, how blessed are we that we have Google? Everything is just a click away. You can Google what to wear to a networking event. That's strategy number one. Go to your closet, find something. You don't have to go shopping. You don't have to bake the break, bake, break the bank to do what you want to do. But go to your closet, find something that you feel good in. Because if you feel good in it and you feel comfortable, you're gonna feel confident. And that is the key, that's step number one. If you don't have someone to go with and you're afraid of that, ask someone, a friend, a colleague, a coworker, maybe a family member. Take someone with you, even if it doesn't feel like they may get something out of the experience, they will enjoy their time with you. So ask someone to accompany you. And the last point is that you can Google things that you can talk to someone about at a networking event. Come up with three questions that when you meet someone, you can ask them. Something besides, what do you do? Or besides, what is your name? But three questions that you can ask someone to truly get to know them, engage with them, and start to build a relationship with them. The last thing I want to tell you about that situation is have a, have a strategy that is an exit plan. So give yourself the grace to say, I am going to go to this, but if I don't like it, and I'm uncomfortable, and my anxiety is rising, I'm leaving after 30 minutes. Yep. If you give yourself that grace, you can just slide out the back door. And chances are nobody's going to notice, especially if you didn't talk to anybody. Right? It's very important to have that strategy in place. And you can do this with anything in life, right? Every single thing that you go through life with, you can create a strategy. Right? <laughs> Let's talk about negativity bias. Negativity bias is the asymmetry in our brain as to how it processes positive and negative experiences. We are, as humans, two-thirds more likely to hold on to negative thoughts and experiences. Our brain is going to process negative things faster than it's going to process positive things. This is not new science. This dates all the way back to our ancestors and the fight, flight, or freeze reaction in our brain. They have to do these those things in order to stay safe. We don't have to re resolve back to that, but our amygdala in our limbic brain is wired to keep us on edge. It's wired that we're going to think that negative things might happen or that negative things are more likely to happen. Our brain is so funny sometimes. If I said to you, you look beautiful today, but someone else said to you yesterday or a week ago, that they weren't crazy about your haircut and you should go back and have it fixed, do you know what you're gonna be thinking about? Your haircut. Not that I just said that you're beautiful. Your brain is immediately gonna go back to that negative thought. So that is why self-talk is so critically important. That is why self-talk is so absolutely critical. 
So let me ask you this question. How many of you in the past week have looked in the mirror and found something to criticize yourself about? Almost everyone. So let's think about that. Now, I'm a pretty curvy girl, and one of the things that I have been known to say is, oh my gosh, these pants make my bum look big. How many other people have said that, right? Now that's a good thing. When I was growing up, that was not a good thing. The other thing that I can find fine fault in are my dark circles under my eyes. And when I look in the mirror, that's a lot of times the first thing I see. So if we want to create a strategy on changing our thoughts, if I am to say, or if any of you were to say, oh my gosh, these pants make my bum look big, assuming that's a bad thing, not a good thing, even though now it's really a good thing, you can change that too. That's the biggest muscle in my body. It makes me strong. I have clothes to wear over my body. And change those thoughts to make it a value versus something that is cumbersome or not good, not, not positive. The same thing with dark circles under my eyes. I can look in the mirror and I can see those, or I can look at my eyes and be thankful that I have eyes to see and that I can see the beauty around me. I can be thankful that I can go home this evening and rest my head on a pillow on a bed and get a good night's rest. So flipping that conversation in our head is so incredibly important. Is it easy to do? No. But what we focus on is what we create. How many of you have experienced waking up in the morning feeling grumpy? And from that point, you spill coffee on your blouse, you get stuck in traffic, the contents of your handbag fall on the floor of your car, your child missed the bus, you have to go back home and get the child, take them to school, and you're late for work. And from that point on, it's a snowball effect. Our thoughts create our results. Let's dissect this. No matter where we are on our journey in life, we have a belief system. Those beliefs about ourselves, the beliefs about the experiences we've had, faith, anything that has been part of our journey has led us to believe something. Our beliefs influence our thoughts. What we believe about ourselves is what we're going to think about ourselves. What we believe about our spouse, our partner, our children, our parents, our job, what we believe influences our thoughts. If we are sitting in a place of negative thoughts, we are going to trigger negative emotions. The more negative our emotions and feelings are, the more likely we are not going to be to take positive action in our life. The more likely we are to stand on the sidelines and be inactive in our own lives to move the needle forward on our life. Maybe we will stop exercising. Maybe we'll grab junk food instead of healthy food. Maybe we will be irritable with all of those around us. And that negative self-talk is going to continue endlessly on a cycle. But that doesn't mean there's no hope. Because in order to get the results we want, we can flip the switch on that conversation and we can make it positive. The way I have done that through the course of my life is using something that I created called my RAG model or the five C's of journaling. The whole goal is to look back onto cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been a proven psychological technique, I guess you would say, for navigating mental health challenges but to recognize those thoughts, those feelings that you're experiencing. When you recognize them, catch them, address them by challenging them. Are they rational? Would someone you love and respect be thinking the same thing that you're thinking? Would they be evaluating the situation in the same way you're evaluating the situation? If the answer to that question is no, Change the thought. Get rid of that thought that is not serving you. Notice I said get rid of. I didn't say get over. Anxiety is not something that you can just get over. Anxiety takes time. It takes action. It takes tools. And a lot of times it takes a team to navigate. But if you use these processes, there is hope. And when there is hope, there can be positive outcomes. 
So this may sound simple, right? It may sound simple, but it's not easy. And I just had a one minute warning, so I'm going to talk really fast. And, but the reason it's not easy is because everything goes back to that thought of negative bias, right? Our brain is telling us all of these negative things that it has been exposed to for all of these years. What society tells us, experiences that we've had. And when our brain is functioning in that negative space, shame tends to arise. When shame arises, we sit in a place of fear and judgment. The only way to overcome fear and judgment and shame is to take action. So think of self-compassion, and I'm going to try to hurry really fast. Think of self-compassion and giving yourself the grace that you would give someone else who hurt you or offended you. Grace means that you're accepting those mistakes, those negative experiences, and you're letting them serve a purpose in your life instead of serving shame. And it's possible for everyone, as long as you're willing to take the action. So I talked to you a little bit about my five C's of journaling and my rag method. And because we're under time, I'm going to hurry through just a few other things that you can do to navigate anxiety and the mindset that's holding you back from anything it is that you're dreaming of doing. Journaling is very, very key because the beautiful thing about our brains is that we can change our neural pathway. Journaling is one way to do that. Catching those negative thoughts, writing them down, challenging them on paper, and changing them to the positive. Flipping that conversation in your head. Meditation is also very powerful, but journaling like meditation, meditation will change those neural pathways in your brain and help you think positive. Breathing is key. Breathe in for six counts, hold for six counts, breathe out for six counts. It's cleansing. Movement is medicine for your mind. The more you move, the healthier you will be physically and mentally. The entire mes message from this conference today. Sleep is paramount. Seven to nine hours of sleep. You cannot function if you are not resetting throughout the night or whenever it is that you sleep. Gratitude is key. Every single day, write down three things that you're grateful for. Things do not happen to you. They happen for you. And the more you accept that and become grateful for those things that you experience, the happier you will be, the more you will be able to transition those thoughts. Faith. You can do anything through him who gives you strength. Philippians 4.13. It's something I recite all the time. You can use scripture verses as, as an affirmation. You can journal around them. You can meditate on them. There are so many other little things you can do, but I am up for time. But I want to just encourage you that when you start taking action, you will see progress. The more progress you see, the more momentum you will build and the more positive outcomes you will experience and you will be able to live with joy and peace and purpose. I don't know.